now the first act of Die Walküre with Astrid Warnay as Sieglinde, Lauritz Belchior as Siegmund, and Alexander Kipnis as Hunding. The two best known numbers, perhaps, in the first act Siegmund's spring song, Winterstürme, Wischen im Hornemann, followed immediately by Du bist der Lenz, which will be sung by Miss Warnay, making her a debut today, singing in place of Madame Lotte Lehmann. To Leinsdorf, looking around, facing the audience, the house lights have again been lowered, we'll have the stormy prelude. My own experience where I first jumped in, all I remember is that when I heard the announcement of my name, he spoke a very strange accent, Astrid Varnay or something of that sort. He tried. But how was he to know that that was a Hungarian name? Nobody could tell him. But Mr. Mr. Cross's voice was unique. You could tell his voice through hundreds of people. And uh, that wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing was that I had to do my work. And after that, went home. Right. Never before had she performed a major role on any operatic stage. Never before had she sung with or over a Wagnerian orchestra. Never before had anyone been so well prepared in spite of no professional experience. All this without any benefit of rehearsal whatsoever. So the word debut doesn't even begin to describe what happened on the afternoon of December 6, 1941. But first, a few words about the beginning of Astrid Varnay's life. Her father was Alexander Varnay, a Hungarian spinto tenor who studied with Hermann Winkelmann, the first Parsifal, and later with Jean Doresque. He once auditioned for Leon Cavallo, who wrote a letter of recommendation for him, saying he was, quote, an authentic tenor discovery, unquote. His roles included the Duke, Faust, Turidu, Canio, Eleazar, Don José, Manrico, Tannhäuser, and Lohengrin. It was said his colleagues trembled when he brandished a sword because his rage was so convincing they thought he might do one of them in. Maria Javor, Ms. Varnay's mother, was a Hungarian coloratur who studied with Roja Obranyi, considered at the time the most prestigious teacher at the Budapest Conservatory. As a harbinger of things to come in Astrid Varnay's life, Madame Obranyi had previously sung under her maiden name Roja Varnay. 
Miss Yavor's roles included Leonora in Il Trovatore, Gilda, Oscar, Lucia, Rosina, Elvira, Frau Flut, Königin der Nacht, Olympia, Violetta, Marguerite in Les Huguenots, and Desdemona. None other than Fritz Reiner introduced Ms. Yavor to Varnay while preparing a contemporary opera in 1911. They married in 1914 and moved to Stockholm. Then, on April 25th, 1918, they gave birth to a daughter named... Iboyko Astrid Maria Varnay. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the names that are also in my passport or uh, mm. recognition card. Right. And the word Iboyka is a violet uh, flower. Yes. It's not like the violets, but it is akin to it. It's a little different. I don't know what it is in Hungary that they have. It's almost like a, a special violet. Special hybrid. And when I was born, they tell me that I had that color eyes. And my father was told uh, the birth is a girl. He came in, looked at me, went out went to the first street florist, bought the whole basket, which was of violets, and threw the violets on my bed to the great consternation <laughs> of the nurse that was taking care of the children there. Yes. And that's how the name Iboyka was. Mm -hmm. And in school they couldn't say Iboyka. Yes. And I said it was like a violet, and so they called me Violet Astrid Varnay. Later that same year, Alexander Varnay ended his singing career and founded and became an industrious manager of a new Norwegian opera comique theater in Christiania, Norway, using mostly Norwegian artists. One such artist was Kirsten Flagstad. In a production of Unbalo in Mascara, the Varnay's baby rested in the bottom drawer of Flagstad's dressing room table as her mother's dressing room table drawers were too high off the ground. Thus began Astrid Varnay's immersion into the world of opera. The company, however, lasted for only three years. In 1922, Maria Javor traveled to Berlin and recorded eight arias. Here is an excerpt of Toy Renama, or Caranome, from Rigoletto. The family moved to New York in 1923. Around this time, Alexander Varnay brought the Met's attention to his wife's recordings, but Amelita Galacurci, Lucrezia Bori, Queen Amario, and Rosa Pancel were the reigning sopranos. Sadly, in 1924, at the age of 35, Alexander Varnay died from kidney disease. Ms. Varnay's mother now auditioned for the Met with La Traviata, but was only offered a Parsifal flower maiden. Maria Yavor now began to appear with the opera company of Alfredo Salmaggi, and in 1926 married one of its leading tenors, Fortunato de Angelis. They gave their daughter a brother by the name of Fortunato Anthony, nicknamed Lucky, in 1927. Astrid Varnay was now totally involved in the family business of operatic singing, soaking up several languages by the age of 10 and learning several roles just by attending her parents' performances. She even saved two trovatores once by jumping in at the last minute as Inez when she was barely a teenager. At the age of 13, she had decided to be a pianist, having entered a New York Times crossword puzzle contest and won her first piano. However, she did have heated discussions with her parents about the quality of acting she would see at the Met. An important addition to the family in the mid-1930s was a radio. 
The first broadcast that I ever heard was before I even wanted to be a singer. We actually, my brother and myself, we, how can you say, practically told our parents we wanted a radio. It was a very small thing. It was almost the size of a woman's uh, shopping bag, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. And they said, well, it's too expensive, and this and that and the other. There was always a reason. Mm -hmm. And then I said, but the Metropolitan is going to give opera on Saturdays. Well, that clinched it. We got the radio. Ms. Varnay's high school glee club director recommended to her mother that she start receiving voice lessons. Her mother agreed, but not until her daughter had turned 18. She continued her piano lessons, but a telling moment came when singing a graduation solo that she herself had written. Though a bit nervous at first, her voice shone and rang out when she had the backing of the chorus. The ultimate decision to change from piano to singing was when she was walking past Steinway Hall one day, hearing horrific sounds of singers practicing. She decided then and there to start lessons, and thereby prove that she was better than them. I was a very lazy person. I studied voice on and off with my mother because she used me as a, uh, let's say, as the second. Like when she practiced Norma, I would do the Adalgisa with her. Really? But uh, I really was not trained at all in order to be a singer. I wanted to be a pianist. And... Uh, what my mother taught was much more after one had told her that I have a voice for opera. But I cannot tell you how she did this. She used vowels. And she believed in the Italian language as being the placement. French was a little too nasal. German could have been a little too guttural. Yes. And so she used for everyone whom she taught a special thing. She asked them to speak or sing, and she found the vowel that was wonderful in each voice. She didn't take people that were just uh, for fun. There must have been some basis to say you have a good voice or you have a possibility of singing well. Yes. And then she practiced with the vowels. First the middle range, and then the ranges depending on what kind of a soprano, even what kind of a tenor. Mm. It would be too long to express what was going on, but she worked on vowels which were important. For instance, E vowel was a very good sound because it was forward in the mask. And she made the e a e a sort of uh, slowly, slayed, uh, slowly changing the throat to form the resonance yes. within another. We could say another, uh, not volume, but space. Yes. The space had to be determined according to the quality of the vowel. Krista Ludwig said that once you find your e punct, you go from there. True, but you have to have somebody who can hear it. And one could have that my mother heard and she helped. She also trained a few people for their own sake. In other words, accompanists, so that the accompanists would know what to do when they were accompanying singers. I was slovenly I mimicked and chopped up various things, and at the same time, my voice from by nature had a certain resonance which with, with which she could work. Otherwise, I cannot remember how it, how it developed. Uh, it depended on, on the role. She didn't take very heavy roles with me. In fact, I think she did more with the solfege uh, that is something that one has to explain to people who don't know what it is, and I don't even remember what it is, but I know it was from tone to tone on A, E, A, O, U, and it's uh, Hishtas, Toshas, it, it, it was Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, Si, Do. Yeah. And my speaking voice was always very clear. 
and I've said to you before, your speaking voice today is the same as it was 50 years ago. Well, I hope not. Well, it's very, it's very. I hope not. I hope it has gained a little bit more maturity. Well, maybe that, but but the sound yes. and the clarity. Well, I know what you mean because I don't think I have ever had a, a squeaky voice. No. But with time, everything that was sopranistic developed, also in a certain mellowness, in a certain. Uh, I cannot show it in speech as much, but I had not. Uh, I never had a squeaky voice and I never had a heavy voice. But my low sounds came more and I had to be careful not to incorporate that lowness too soon. Not to put any weight. Not to put any weight upon it because that would have pulled down the upper registers from C to F or F sharp, what they call the passaggio. The passage towards the F sharp on the top. Yes. That had to be so that one could take something from the low, take mm-hmm. it a little away, so that you could go towards the top. Mm-hmm. That's all I remember. Mm-hmm. You had a voice lesson every day? When it became necessary, yes. And in that way my mother saved a great deal of time, because if you have a teacher who teaches once or twice a week, then mistakes can happen. My mother didn't allow a mistake from Monday to go to Tuesday. She worked on it. I sometimes became very disturbed about it, but in the long run, she was right. Yes, yes. She said, we're saving time. I'm not letting any errors develop in the voice. Nipping them in the bud. And That's right. Stopping Of them. course, there were passages one would have to repeat again and again and again when the words came. Yes. Right. Astrid Varnai now began attending Met performances from Standing Room for the price of one dollar and continued observing, learning, and becoming a virtual sponge for knowledge and experience. In the late 1930s, she heard her first Wagner opera, Das Rheingold, Around that time, she sang for Kirsten Flagstad, who said she had the makings of a, quote, fine, jugendlich dramatisch sopran, unquote. At this point, she had Aida, Leonora, and Desdemona, and the three E's, Eva, Elizabeth, and Elsa, under her belt. But Flagstad recommended that she start working with an authentic Wagner expert and met staff member Hermann Weigert, the man who had accompanied Flagstad's Met audition in Switzerland. Ms. Varnay sang arias of Elizabeth and Elsa for him, and thus began a flourishing artistic and personal relationship. My husband had a very great ear for singers because he had known people in Europe and where the, all of the people who were studying went through these various places like Berlin. Berlin was a place where everybody sang who was. Astrid Varnay committed to three years of intense, thorough study, twice a week, and it was completed in half the time. Weigert had become her conservatory. The next opinion came from Met staff member George Zell. He admired her musicianship and recommended that she sing for Edward Johnson. It happened in the ladies' parlor room in July of 1940. Johnson was pleased with all areas of her singing and asked her to write a letter telling about herself, her studies, and her repertoire. Keeping in mind that she was all of 22 years old, the letter read as follows. Dear Mr. Johnson, Herewith, please accept the following data for which you so kindly requested after the audition on Wednesday, July 10, 1940. Name, Violet Varney. Age, 22. Born, Stockholm, Sweden, Hungarian descent. Education, elementary and high school, completed. Private musical college, eight years pianoforte. Languages, English, German, French, Italian, Hungarian. Vocal training received from my mother. Repertoire studied with maestro Hermann Weigert. Repertoire, German. Zenta, Elsa, Elizabeth, Eva, Sieglinde, Brunhilde of Die Walküre, Brunhilde of Siegfried, 
Brunhilde of Götterdämmerung. In preparation, Isolde, Third Norn, Gutrune. Italian, Aida, Desdemona, Santuzza, Leonora from La Forza del Destino. Other parts in preparation. With sincere appreciation and gratitude, respectfully yours, Violet Varnai. The staff thought it was a joke, but the following November, an audition was arranged in the top floor roof stage, vaulted glass ceilings, and spacious. Everyone from the front office wanted to attend, something not to be missed. They thought it would be short and sweet. Edward Johnson made the first request, the immolation scene. She then proceeded to sing for two hours, everything she knew. Their faces went from show me to unexpected and bewildered. But Johnson was not convinced her voice would carry in the 3,465-seat house. The following May of 1941, a stage audition was arranged. She sang the Liebestod and Brunhilde's Battle Cry. The gods were with her for this. Just as she began the Hoyo Toho, a tremendous thunderstorm rang out, and she sang with great joy, feeling truly like Wotan's daughter. Backstage, Edward Johnson offered her her first contract, a three-year contract, $75 per week for the first year, $98 for the second, $122.50 for the third. Johnson directed her to discuss it with Columbia artist manager Andre Mertens. He waived all commission charges except for concert work, but he also felt the name Violet Varney was not appropriate. The first man, Mr. Mountain Mountains or Martins, who was a very fine agent, said, you don't look like a Violet. Mm -hmm. Let's take Virginia. And I said, Ham? And of course, he didn't realize he was also from Germany. Yeah. And he said, well, what do we mean? And I said, well, mostly when people cannot act well, and they are called hamming mm -hmm. the word. So Virginia was out, and I actually said, don't you think that Astrid, Astrid, which was the name of the princess in Sweden at the time when I was born, and they wanted to thank the country that gave them a daughter, my parents. Mm -hmm. They were very shall we say, ecstatic people. It has an impact. And uh, I must say, it stood good, too. Uh, some people believe in uh, numbers, and Astrid and Varanai have certain numbers, six, six times each. And, and the si 6th of December... Now, Astrid Varnai was able to observe any rehearsal of any opera, any performance from backstage, any orchestral rehearsals, lessons from the stagehands, etc., the totality of her craft. She also continued being a standee, but didn't tell any of her fellow standees about her upcoming debut in January of 1942 as Elsa in Lowenburg. On the afternoon of December 5th, 1941, Ms. Varney took the subway from Greenwich Village and arrived at the Opera House for a coaching with maestro Eric Leinsdorf, the conductor of her debut. Upstairs in the Stark studio, Leinsdorf cryptically greeted her by asking what she was to work on with him. She said Elsa, but he told her that was in fine shape. He would like to hear Zieglinde. Obviously, she was not prepared for this at all, but sang in half voice the entire role for him anyway, note perfect and without score. He then told her to report to costumes and makeup. She said, why? Leinsdorf replied, because you're making your debut tomorrow. Madame Lotte Lehmann, the scheduled Zieglinde, had canceled the Valkyra broadcast due to a cold, and all the covers were unavailable. Helen Traubel couldn't because this would be her first Valkyra Brunhilde. Rose Bampton was scheduled for Donna Anna that night and couldn't sing her first Zieglinde the next day. And Irene Jessner was on tour in the Midwest. Miss Varney did as she was told and then went home. She bought roses for her mother and tried to rest and get a good night's sleep. What did she dream about? Zieglinde. The following day, she walked into the opera house unnoticed by her fellow standees. The standee line groaned at the cancellation announcement about Madame Lehmann and a certain Astrid Varney was replacing her. 
They didn't know who this was, as they knew her as Violet. One standee ran to the lobby and checked the photo. It was their friend, Violet. The stage director walked her through her paces, and the afternoon Sigmund, Lauritz Melchior, gave her a slap on the shoulder, saying, Verlass dich auf mich, or count on me, calming her small amount of nervousness. After all, it was the family business. The first act was, according to Ms. Varney, a thrilling dream. Oh, 